please welcome to the stage, Liam Darbin, Director of Digital and Innovation, Tate. Hello everyone. Um, you can probably tell I'm British. Uh, it's a long flight out, but wow, it's great to be here. I wonder how long it's still appropriate for us to say, wow, it's great to be here in person. Um, I'm Liam, my pronouns are he, him. Um, I'm a very tall six foot four guy with dark brown hair and I'm wearing chinos and a suit jacket. So a pre-innovation series talk disclaimer, I am an absolute insights obsessive and I am an absolute people obsessive. I grew up in a large multicultural family in the UK and my experiences with that grew me to this fascination of why do people do what they do? Why don't people do what they do? And how can I help people do what they want to do? The last couple of years have been hard, right? A lot of people have been asking, when will normal return? What is the new normal? But the world has changed and is changing. And our audiences, our customers, our visitors, our supporters are changing too. Locally, for me at Tate, and I'm sure some of you, we're seeing this translate into a harder business to run. The mission is still abundantly clear for us, to increase the understanding and enjoyment of art for everyone. But quite simply, our P&L is just really difficult to manage and to balance. Our audiences, they're more local, hyper-local. They're slightly younger, they're more diverse. We're seeing fewer international visitors, Booking periods are much shorter than pre-COVID, and the percentage of online bookings has grown. Spend per head has nudged forward, but we're seeing less frequency and a slightly higher dwell. Our net promoter score has moved forward, and more of our visitors are engaging with us cross-channel. And a higher percentage of those are also spending cross-category and with a mixed basket. And all of this has changed in just three years. The reality is that most, if not all, organizations globally are experiencing something similar. So what are a couple of consumer market insights that are really applicable to us here? Experiences, immersive and, and experiential. But why? Simple, because they're social. People come together to share an experience, digitally or physically. Sharing time with your loved ones has never, ever been more important. The science would also show that experiences tend to be multi-sensory and commit to your memory more easily and with greater recall. Second, the blend. Whether it's your morning coffee, your evening cocktail, or as I like to say, your omni-channel strategy, uh, it's all about the blend. Driving, convenience, driving engagement has never been more important, but it's gotta be user-centric. And let's be honest, it isn't really an option anymore. It's just an expectation. And lastly, inclusivity and social impact. Authentically addressing opportunities to improve your carbon footprint, social injustice, race, religion, well-being, and mental health, and our role as global citizens and custodians. There are obviously many, many more macro societal changes at play. But for us here, there's also potentially one small but key trend, the cultural emergence within commercial settings. More and more commercial companies are recognizing the importance of culture and the power of marrying culture with commerce. You may have heard of a Japanese artist called Yaye Kasama who worked with Louis Vuitton to design a range of exclusive products and take over their whole global retail estate. Or you might have heard of Selfridges, a UK department store in London uh, on Oxford Street that had its first in-store exhibition called Universe in partnership with Paco Rabanne. Is this competition? Oh, I don't think so. I think it reinforces what we've already known. The reality is we have all the culture in our hands here. It's our challenge to take that to our public and where necessary translate that into commercial opportunities. And that's why I hope you'll agree by the end of this presentation that one of my key takeaways is culture is the future of commerce. Given this, how do we continue to adapt? 
how do we meet intergenerational expectations? How do we stay relevant? For all the things I've just described and for all the things you're gonna hear at TLCC over this week, I'm sure many of you get the sense we're at a pivotal moment. Gen Z, or Gen Z, um, uh, and Gen Alpha are often called future generations. However, many of Gen Z uh, are already in the workplace, they already have a sense of independence, they already have some disposable income. And one thing is consistent across these generations. They want brands to show me you know me. Not in a kind of creepy way, uh, but in an authentic, engaging, and timely manner. Show me you know me forms part of the win the whole visit strategy at Tate. It responds to our audience's need for us to support them on their journey with art and culture. For example, did you know that 70% of Gen Z and Alpha consumers believe your website will know what they're looking for before they tell you? They believe it. They don't think it, they don't want to believe it, they just believe it. 88% of Gen Z and Alpha consumers want brand experiences delivered by blending digital and physical touch points. Remember, it's all about the blend. User-centric and brand consistent. 82% of Gen consumers will also trust a company more if it uses actual images of its actual customers. So build a community of advocates, utilize your user-generated content across your channels and celebrate the relationships and impact you have on your audiences. Perhaps most importantly though, research completed by McKinsey shows that both generations are looking beyond tangible products. They're trying to understand what makes a company tick. What's the mission? What's the purpose? This is potentially my next key takeaway. All of us in this room work for and with the most incredible organizations, missions, and purposes. The opportunity is clearly to reach beyond the transactional and create a deeper, more meaningful relationship with our audiences. The challenge is the right moment to tell the right story. But based on what I've just said, most of those audiences already believe you know what they want and when they want it. So our opportunity is to stay true to our why and start to convey to them why they need it. I hope these insights have now landed after a short period of pause there. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and there'll be useful provocations. But more importantly, I hope they give you a sense that this pivotal moment is actually maybe not our biggest challenge, but our biggest opportunity. Win the whole visit at Tate is the notion that our brand and our experiences, our spaces and our channels mean different things to different people. And as a cultural and social space, we're often trying to accommodate those differing needs. I'll give you a personal example, a sample size of one. When I go to Tate with my family, my mum likes to take her time with each of the artworks, each of the artists. My dad, he'll probably you know, walk relatively quickly, browse, maybe stop, maybe glance. But the reality is, by the time my mum's viewed one room, my dad's visited the whole gallery. <laughs> my brother will gravitate towards illustrative art, maybe a talk or a class. My sister, slightly more experiential. And my other sister, much like me, likes a bit of everything, so you'd probably find us at a Tate Late event. Most of us are interested in the bars, the restaurants, my dad mainly for the wine list, my mum, the shops, uh, but we all enjoy the outside architecture and the surroundings. My mum will book online, but she will call up just to double check everything's gone through. <laughs> my dad wouldn't know where to start. My brother and my two sisters and I, we'd probably just turn up. We will all pay with card now. My parents will pay with a physical card, but they will celebrate the fact that they're using contactless. <laughs> and the rest of us will probably use Apple Pay and Android. They're small but noticeable differences. So how do you respond to these varying needs? For us, we're starting with our data. In partnership with Tessitura, we have and are building out our single customer view. Integrating Tessitura with our existing touch points 
um, uh, online and in our physical spaces, mastering these touch points with things like Wi-Fi logons, our cross-channel purchase and browse behavior, uh, our in-gallery, our restaurants, our shop transactions, and pulling these against individual customer records, allowing us to deepen our understanding of audience behavior, segment more meaningfully, and provide an individualized, brand-aligned experience at each interaction. This will be a foundational game changer for TAME, realizing the insights of our first party data and allowing us to analyze and forecast future needs. Our audience are also more willing to test, to allow you to test things on them than you may think they are, especially the younger audiences. As long as your interactions retain your why and are brand aligned, you should feel confident in taking your audiences on this journey, innovating, iterating, and developing your propositions alongside them. A simple example, you remember I mentioned Yaya Kasama earlier, and we have one of her exhibitions on at Tate, which includes two of her immersive mirror rooms. I'm sure like many of you, bundling products through the ticketing purchase flow is something that you've tried. Donations, merchandise, tours, classes, experiences, upsells in general. Whilst these were broadly successful for us and we learned a lot, experiences that furthered the social elements of a visit to Tate alongside the immersive experience of that exhibition were the most effective. Eating and drinking filled this need. So, we've been bundling our tickets with Kasama-inspired lunches, afternoon teas, sake and champagne tasting, and sunset cocktails on our roof terrace. Fascinatingly, some of the quickest audience segments to book these bundles were our Tate Collective young members, those aged between 16 and 25. These F&B experiences alone have generated more than three quarters of a million pounds a year for us. Socially, eating, drinking, and shopping play a unique role within the cultural setting. They deepen the connection between those visiting and with your brand. This is often because audiences are seeking unique and unexpected experiences and products that can only be found in a cultural space. But they can also lower the barrier to entry. It's perhaps unsurprising that eating, drinking, shopping has a lower barrier to entry than consuming our own cultural content. So how do we further extend the cultural experience in our restaurants, bars, cafes, shops, transitionary spaces well, as you've heard, we've already got thematic menus inspired by culture, art, people. But what happens when you put actual art or performance in these spaces? What happens when you allow the creative, the performer, the artist to collaborate and take over these spaces? Is there a further way for us to connect our audiences with our why? Let me take you on a journey. Imagine, if you will, as you walk down the South Bank in London, next to the River Thames, your eyes catch the bright reflections of a neon ice cream van. As you approach, you're welcomed by a 3D neon tiger situated in the window. It's quite the sight. You enter the space, and a mix of fruit and oud smells wash over you, welcoming you into the world of Tate Edit x Chyla, Tate's first ever artist takeover of a shop in collaboration with artist Chyla Kamari Singh Berman. Your eyes dart across the space, Taking in the wall of neons, the variety of products, merchandise on fluorescent fixtures bejeweled with Chyla's blinktastic recommendations and prints. You catch a glimpse of yourself in our selfie mirror and you pop a post on Instagram under hashtag TakeXChyla before being seduced by the carefully curated book wall. As you start browsing a book, a colleague introduces you to Berman's Ice Cream, a unique cardamom and mango coffee made exclusively for Tate as a nod to Chyla's father, who owned an ice cream van in Liverpool. You take your book and a tiger hoodie to the till point, and you notice yourself stepping to this beat of eclectic, Chyla-inspired music, so you scan the Spotify code and save the playlist for later. Once you've made your purchase, you head across to the wrapping station, and you cover your purchases in neon papers and jewels. As you wander towards the exit, you scan the QR code to browse the experience further online and book your ticket to our next Tate Edit Talks event. Exiting, you're not quite sure what you've just experienced. <laughs> Art, culture, commerce, you've shopped, 
You've touched, you've seen, you've smelled, you've tasted. But perhaps more importantly, you've shared an experience. Our first artist takeover of the shop was wildly successful, meeting audiences where they are and providing access to art and culture within a space that's accessible, relatable, and often goes against the classic look, don't touch etiquette of a gallery setting. When the whole visitor Tate is about recognizing art, culture, and our spaces can be genuinely open to everyone, connecting with audiences at a time, place, or channel that is meaningful and convenient to them. Show me, you know me. In times like these, it's about ensuring we continue to challenge ourselves to be more audience-centric and more future-facing, whilst also becoming more financially resilient. These are changeable times, but this is a pivotal moment for us to firmly lean into. Perhaps this is the biggest opportunity for our generation to secure the future of culture for generations to come. Thank you.